Father, we're grateful for grace and mercy. Thank you for our church. I thank you for holding us together for going on 50 years. I thank you for the pastor that's been faithful to teach and develop so much foundation in the lives of believers. I mean, just literally thousands of people over 45 plus years all over the nation and all over the world. This church reaches. Thank you for Rick, for his ministry in Africa, and for Jackie, and for, for oh, what's your name? Uh, what's your name? Patty. Patty. <laughs> I don't know. I've only known you 40 years, so. Thank you for, for Jackie and Patty and their courage to go and into places uh, up in the woods and teach young women and women in general that God loves them. Thank you for Willie, for his courage and his heart. I thank you for Gary. Thank you for Jeff downstairs. Thank you for all this, Father. And I pray that you take our ministries, our work for you, and you use it in such a way that we reach out to this world. Because we're, we're in a, the world's in a, in a pickle. Of course, the world's always in a pickle. And, it, and the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We're here, Father. This is yours. It's not ours. Give us guidance. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's look at this study. There's going to be three studies. The first one is going to be a model of human behavior because... Uh, my focus in my life and ministry, uh, I, I enjoy, see, we have an educator. We have a pastor who educates about, he teaches books, he teaches categories, he teaches all kinds of foundational things. I have the luxury, now see, I've been in that role where I had to do the very same thing. You teach everything so that you're educating. I have the luxury of focusing on how your walk works. How does the walk function? And I know there's in this room, there will be differences of opinion about that. We're just trying to understand the scriptures. And so it's okay to be at a different place and have a different view. It's okay. We're all working toward a greater understanding. And listen, that's how mature people deal with differences. You don't judge each other or criticize each other. You edify each other. You disagree, maybe, but it's okay. You may know more than me. Doubtful, but again, I'm just playing. Yep. Are you happy? This is not on your paper. Are you happy, confident, content, fulfilled? Are you able to smile and laugh at your difficulties? I mean, where are you in your life? Are you happy? Are you content? Well, if you say, yes, I am. Well, my question is, what desires that you have had that, that have been fulfilled? What is it that God has done that's brought you to this place of contentment, confidence? I just want you to think about it. Another question, are you miserable? Are you, do you live your life mostly afraid, frustrated? How about unrequited? A love, a desire, a hunger for something unrequited. It just never has come around. Are you angry? Are you judging and blaming? Are you finger pointing in your life towards someone? Is some, are you in a relationship that's just difficult and you're pointing the finger? Look, point it back this way. That's the only way it gets better, is when you point it back this way. But I want to talk about desire. I want to talk about desire, and I want to share some things with you in the, in the time that we have about desire that I think will help you in the way your Christian walk works, the way your, your awareness of it. Okay? So this study, and listen, I know... We'll never get to all this on the paper. I wrote all this so if those of you that want to read it and follow it and look at all the verses, 
and follow the logic here, then you're able. But we're going to abbreviate this. So four things that are in this, all right? The premise, my premise in this, and I believe it's biblical, is that the root of every goal and plan, every thought, feeling, word, and action, the root of that, the beginning of that, is a desire. Everything works off desire. You don't do anything without starting with a desire. Jesus called it hunger and thirst. Thank you, Ronald, for introducing my study with your discussion of John 7. That's where you get this realization that God made us empty with that this emptiness creates a hunger and thirst. And that's what drives all of human behavior. So, the premise is that behind everything is a desire. And so, four things. God made us with an empty place that causes us to crave, long, desire for it to be filled. And that only He can properly fill this void. And listen, what's really important is He uses this desire, this hunger and thirst to bring sinners to salvation. Now, I just want to play this short video. Man, we are getting to high tech here. All right, watch. This is about hunger. This is Bernard Langer. He's a famous golfer. Wonderful. One of my favorite guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Bernard Langer. This is my lovely wife, Vicky. And uh, we're on the border of Little Life of South Florida. We uh, really care about families and relationships. Now, let me tell you how I got to meet Jesus in a personal way. I grew up in Germany in a very, and I say very, religious home. We did all the right things. We made all the right notes. We were in to go to church. I went to church every single day before school. I was altar boy for nine years. I went to confession. I did all the proper things to hopefully be good enough to earn my way to heaven. Um, and the problem with that is what is good enough and what is not. So fast forward a few years, I come over to America and uh, I'm a professional golfer. I win the Masters in April of 1985. And uh, having won that tournament, one of the biggest, at being number one in the world, uh, ranking, I've had money, I had fame, I had cars, I had a beautiful young wife, which is married a year earlier. I had everything going that the world can offer at this point. Yet I felt this amazing emptiness inside of me and I could not pinpoint what this could be. I should have been thrilled and happy and over the moon. Uh, yet there was this void inside of me and I couldn't understand why. Okay. He goes on to explain that that emptiness and void that he felt was the driving force behind him coming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that illustrates this idea that I'm pointing to here is that there's an emptiness within us. So this hunger and thirst is meant to drive us to God. The second idea is this hunger and thirst because we're separated from God, we mismanage this hunger and thirst and we attach it to the sin nature, we attach it to the world. So we try to get what this, hunt, this, this need for fulfillment, we try to get from, from, the, from people, from situations, from possessions, from the world. And this creates a terrible problem. The third idea is that desire itself is neutral. Now, this is my view. It's not everyone's view, but it's a natural expression of need. And prior to salvation, desire is exclusively attached to the sin nature and to, a, to the world's ideas. We form a belief system. Paul calls it the lust of the flesh or the desire of the flesh, which includes, listen, this is important, it includes not only personal sin, but it includes everything in your human life that you are using 
as a, as a source of meaning, purpose, happiness, contentment. This is what you're after more than God. It's your human agenda that says, I can find happiness without God. Now you say, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I, believe, I mean, I go to church. Well, yeah, but most of what you pursue is, is earthly. It may not even be sinful or worldly, it's just earthly. You're trying to get it here, and your happiness is here. Not here, not with God. That's your human agenda, and that's part of the lust of the flesh. I would, I would suggest it's the biggest part of the lust of the flesh. So, all right. The fourth idea, and, and listen, this, this third idea is illustrated in a passage we use all the time, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. We'll look at it. And fourthly, the Holy Spirit enlightens us revealing, I think I've got reveling, re reveling God, and, and, and enables us to attach our desire, which Jesus again, hunger and thirst, enabling us to break free from the slavery of our human agenda because we're stuck on this human agenda. We've had it our whole life. And so we can give our lives to His agenda. The point is, in all of this, we use our volition to choose the objects to which we attach our desires, our faith, our hope. We choose. And that's what's important. Now, whoever's right about in differences and details and all that, what's important is that you now being saved, you choose to be saved by believing the gospel. You choose to become spiritual and grow into maturity by choosing to believe God's word for living the Christian life. Those are the, those, it's, it's your, you attach what you, you make, what God has for you, what you want. What's the old saying? The happiness does not come from getting what you want. It comes from wanting what you get. Wanting what you get, right? Because who here got what you wanted? <laughs> who here, here got what you expected? Yeah, I know. Play poker if you want to. All right, I'm going to go through the, I've got five points if you'll just go through them just real quickly with me. First, God designed our souls to be needs-based, meaning that He made us to possess inherent needs. We need God. We need each other. And that these needs, when fulfilled, provide a, a sense of completion. You spoke about it first half, the perfection a satisfaction that we equate with contentment or happiness. All right? And Blaise Pascal from the 1600s says, a man has a God-shaped hole in his heart, same thing Bernard Longer was saying, that produces a craving and longing that only God can fill. This was John 7. Now, the second point... If you just push to the second point, our hunger and thirst, when we attach our hunger and thirst to the sin nature and the world, this often produces a temporary gratification, but also it makes you an idolater. Because now you're looking to something in the world for your happiness and, and provision that only God can provide. So rather than attach yourself to God, you've attached yourself to something in the world. So, and, and this is going to be a big problem. We'll show you what it does to you. The third point, primarily what makes desire good, sinful, or evil. I mean, how do you know if I, my desire is good? Well, it's determined by the object to which you attach it. The Greek word epithumeo, epithumia, oh, I'm not going to do that. Epithumia means intense desire. Thumos means passion, emotion. Epithumos means an intense desire of emotion, and uh, it's used for desire. It's the primary word 
in the Bible for desire, and it's the word used for lust. Every time you see the word lust in the New Testament, it's probably epithemia. So you would think this word epithemia means a bad desire, right? It's the word used for sinful desire. It's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's epithumia. Of course, it, then it goes on to say, the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit sets what? Its desire. Hey, listen, the Spirit's epithumia against the flesh. Yeah. Point is, epithumia, sin nature, epithumia to the spirit. Same word. We're going to go, we'll see that that word is used by Jesus. It's used by Paul to describe their desires. So point is, this desire, epithumia, is, not, is neither sinful or righteous in and of itself. <laughs> in and of itself. So, fourthly, the ministry of the Spirit encourages us to reject desire attached to the human agenda, which would be success or wealth, whatever, while attaching hunger and thirst to God and His plan, believing that you already have what you need. So, we'll get to that if I don't get to preaching too much, but... So the first principle, go back to point one, God designed our hearts, ourself, with an empty place. John 7, 37 through 39. He says, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood out and cried, saying, if any man is thirsty. Now this is one of, this, Jesus likes this metaphor of being thirsty. He used it all through the book of John. Oh. Uh, he said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And what, he meant, what does it mean, drink? He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being. And this innermost being word means an empty place. It's mostly translated womb. Every time you see it, almost all the time, it's the womb. What is a womb? Empty place where a baby grows. Sort of. Uh, and, 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 and I don't really, I'm not asking for a biological lesson. It, it's okay. But anyway, so he who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So Jesus likes this term, these terms, hunger and thirst. And it's an indication of a, of a desire that is being attached in a spiritual way. All right? He likes, like Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, several things. How about hunger and thirst to be righteous to be saved? Or how about a hunger and thirst that I have to be righteous in the way I live? How about the hunger and thirst to be perfectly, ultimately righteous in heaven. So, hunger and thirst for things to be right. You know, how about a hunger and thirst for the world to be righteous during the millennium? Wouldn't that be nice right now? So, how about John 6, 35? He, he talks about the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and what he who believes in me will never thirst. Okay? So he's the spiritual food and he's the spiritual drink that we're to believe in. Drinking is believing. And then he uses this living water analogy, which, listen, living water analogy comes out of Jeremiah 2. Book of Jeremiah is all about this. He's, he's talking about you're thirsty and so you go to find the living water with, with, with broken cisterns. A broken a cistern was a place of holding water, and a broken cistern, it all leaked out. 
So you go, what, to the world for your, your water, for what your soul needs, and there is none. That's the idea. Christ, and listen, he calls himself the fountain of living water. This is the same fountain that he puts inside of you. All right, so. John, and listen, in John chapter 4, we're going to listen, he leads right up to this living water thing. He sees the woman at the well. She's thirsty. Lord, give me some of this water so that I may not thirst again. Hey, lady, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for some living water. Mm hmm. She's like, you know, I've seen, I, I know all about men. I'm not sure what this living water is you're talking about, but he won her over. We get to John chapter 7, those who are thirsty for God come and drink. And the Holy Spirit will produce this fountain of living water that flows out of you. It flows in you and fills you up and then flows out. We begin with an unsatisfied longing that we don't know how to fulfill. I mean, do you have, do you feel that? Is there, is there something in your heart inside of you that says, I don't have what I need. Don't have what I need. I mean, there's something missing in my life. There's an emptiness in me that I've not fulfilled yet. Now, there's many of you in this church that say, no, I don't have that. But you did. There was a time you had that. But through growth, you've managed to be full of God. And you overflow. You have ministry in your life. You overflow. That's the goal. But listen, this hunger and thirst is what drives us. It's what, and listen, if, you're, if I'm speaking to someone mature who's already flowing, listen, you need to seek desire for more. Here's my point. God's plan for motivating us is not duty. There is duty, but he doesn't use that. He uses desire. Love. He said, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to be close. I want to be intimate. I want to have a love relationship. I'm not looking for just little soldiers that come into the throne room of God and salute. I'm looking for people that come in and are in love with me, that want to serve me, that are joyful in this. So what do you use in your life? I used to use fear. I used to use guilt. I thought if I felt guilty enough, maybe I'd quit doing stupid things. Then I was just, I was guilty and stupid. So uh, that's all that did. Now, this, this emptiness produces a longing and craving. So it ultimately will lead you to God if you let it, like Bernard. We use our volition to choose, learning, often learning from wrong choices that fail to satisfy, finally arriving at God. You hit enough dead ends. If you're an honest seeker, when you hit these dead ends, you turn around and go, well, that didn't work. Boom, here, that didn't work. You know, I used to think of myself like a fly trying to get out the window. Do, 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 do. All my wrong choices. So, finally, finally, I found the open window, and there was God. How about that? So, I just made up my own analogy, didn't I? I likened myself to a fly. Desire is God's tool to drive you to seek for fulfillment that only He can provide. Desire is your friend. Now, I know that may seem nebulous and esoteric, and who cares? Boy, if you would listen to that, if you would listen to that and listen to yourself and look inside your heart and find your desire, your hunger, your thirst that you may have numbed out and, and put away somewhere. Now, secondly, when this hunger and thirst that God has, has allowed us to have, when we attach it to the sin nature, we look to the world and our, and our pleasures for gratification. Okay, that's, this is, 
The first idea is we look to God. The second idea is we look to the, some kind of lascivious or ascetic pleasure or our human agenda. Now, listen, I'll read this. Hunger and thirst is attached to the sin nature, either lascivious or ascetic, and the world produces a temporary gratification. I mean, you can get satisfaction short term, doesn't last, leaves you emptier than you were when you started, which sets you down a path of ever-increasing hunger and degeneracy. But give it a shot if you want. It's one of those terrible dead ends. But it leads to idolatry, to a process of ever-increasing dege degeneration and diminishing satisfaction of your longings. Now, in the news right now is this Sound of Freedom movie that's talking about the sex trade, child sex trade, child sex slavery and porn, organ and blood harvesting, child sacrifices in the news. Do y'all know about this? I know, look. It's terrible. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to envision, but this is reality. This is the devil's world, and the devil's really, really whacking away at it right now. And listen, the internet and, and the, the uh, boom in, uh, what is it, the Renaissance and the technology revolution and all this business, so that we're worldwide, man, that's given this guy the ability to do this stuff all over the world. Of course, he was doing it anyway, but now it's all hooked up. Anyway, that's what we're talking about. Listen, how do you get to the point of just you grow, you're born and you grow up a semi-normal person and, and somehow you get to this point where you're involved in seeing little children sexualized and you want that and you hunger for that and you use that. How do you get to that point? Well, you give your hunger and thirst to your sin nature. And you gratify it in some vanilla kind of way. But the vanilla is not enough. Now you want a little chocolate. And before you know it, you've, gone, you've made all of these short-term decisions with diminishing satisfaction that requires something more and more novel and extreme to satisfy you so that you get to this terrible place of desperation for something to satisfy you. That's how they get there. That's how they convince, listen, that's how the that same process is how they convinced school teachers in Germany to pull the lever at Auschwitz and do these horrible things. They, they were micro moves toward that direction. They didn't just take a school teacher out of the classroom and say, hey, now you're going to gun down these people. Slowly, 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 they worked them, he worked them there. That's that process of degeneration and ever-increasing degeneracy with diminishing satisfaction. It's an awful thing. We used to call it frantic search. It's exactly what that is. So, if you got Bibles, do y'all use Bibles in your life? If you'll turn to Romans 16, 18, it's pretty important. If you would do that real quick, this may be all we get, and this is really important. Romans 16, 18. <clears throat> okay. All right, no, all right, listen. Go back to verse 17. He says, I urge you, brothers, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions, uh, dissensions, i.e. divisions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you've learned, and turn away from them. For such men are, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Now see this phrase, they are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. The word appetites is the same word that Jesus used 
for this empty place. Here's what's happened. They, they have this empty place, and instead of giving it to God and attaching it to God and pursuing God to fill that emptiness, they attached it to the sin nature and to the world. And it made them slave, became slaves to their desires, these sin nature desires. They became slaves. You know what that's called? Starts with an A. D.D. Addiction. Addiction. They became slaves. They became enslaved to this need, this desire. Now, turn to Philippians 3.19, and we'll see the same thing. If you'll do that real quickly. Quickly, quickly. I'll read it while you're turning. He says, Verse 18, many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end, whose destination, whose destiny is destruction, whose God is their empty place, their appetites, whose glory is in their shame. And here's, here's how you know where you're at with it. This is the human agenda. See, this isn't just some lascivious, you're not caught in some orgy in, in you know, the bad part of town. He says, whose mind is set on earthly things. So your appetite, so this, this can be your appetite for success. Listen, the ministry is full of people with appetite for success. <laughs> Paul. Paul was in the ministry, and he had a tremendous appetite for success. Hunger. He was ambitious. So, all right, let me give you a few ideas here. First, this appetite, this koilos, this empty place is attached to the sin nature, and it creates this desire for ever-increasing, dissatisfying carnal pleasures. You become slaves to sinful pleasure, this is lascivious. The lascivious side is some kind of lust toward a pleasure center in your body normally. But listen, do you know what ascetic lust is? People that are, are very organized and straight and everything's clean. And listen, their lust is for order. Their lust is to have everything controlled. Their lust is for everybody to be in line. Their line. And when you're not, their lust is to judge and be self-righteous and be critical. It's a desire. It's a lust. And it becomes an addiction in people. And we call it being religious. Started with a desire. Okay? A desire for controlling. Often that comes out of a fear. But I digress. So. This Philippians passage, desire is their God. They worship and serve. They worship and serve their appetites. And they have an increasing degeneracy. They attach the emptiness to the world, to the sin nature, and it creates a frantic misery, an overwhelming shame, ruin, ruin in the sin of the death as a believer. So listen, you... Uh, you attach yourself to the sin. And listen, we do this. We're born into this. We're born into it. And we do this until we're saved, and then we have an option. And I would say many, many, most baby believers don't ever really develop enough spiritual life to overcome all that. The ones that look like mature Christians, and I'm not saying there's not mature Christians, but a lot of them, they're really ascetic and they're moral, and they, they can uh, appear, they, they can seem like mature people. But listen, without the doctrine, without the spiritual growth, without the ministry of the Spirit, without walking in the Spirit and the dynamics of the spiritual life, you're not going to be mature. You may look like it, but you're not. So, all right. Now, what happens when you attach your hunger and thirst to 
that only, listen, that only God can fill when you attach it to people or circumstances, what, is the, what are the people and circumstances always going to do to your expectations? Disappoint. Disappoint. Why? They can't do what you want them to do. You're trying to get them to be God for you. And so you attach this longing to a romantic relationship. You attach this longing to the approval of other people, and so you drive yourself for success. Whatever. You're trying to get something out of the world in, your, in this life that will fill up this emptiness, and it always ends up in pain and suffering and disappointment. And because of that, because of that, we all use a mechanism called being numb. People who've gone through many disappointments in their life are, are, have learned how to become numb. And listen, here's what they do. They stop desiring much of anything. You know why? It's too risky. It's too painful when it doesn't come true. You attach yourself to somebody new and you're mad, you're going for it, and you're so excited. Or maybe it's the same person again and again and again. And then it's like, here we are again. And so finally what you do is you quit wanting anything. Now there's a way to quit wanting in the Lord. And that is to give all that to Him and look to Him to fill that emptiness. Because that emptiness needs to be filled for you to have happiness and contentment. It has to be. It's the design. It's the divine design. So we attach it to people and it never works. And so we end up having to just numb ourselves. We build walls behind which we live so that people can't hurt us. We don't ever let ourselves, we don't extend ourselves personally. If you're focused, and listen, I did this, I still do this. But the Lord said to me, son, love is greater than truth. What does that mean, Lord? It means if, you, if, you're only, if you're only offering to people is truth, all you can give them is truth, then that's good, but you're likely hiding yourself behind a wall. You don't want to get hurt. You don't want to put yourself out there and extend yourself and make yourself vulnerable. You don't want to love. I mean, you don't want to personally love and become attached because people are going to fail you, so you, you're numb. And he said, even when you build that wall, son, even I can't get through that wall. I mean, so I could, but I won't. You're there alone. You've chosen to be alone and be numb and hide yourself so that you don't fail and you don't get hurt. And, and listen, you may call it psychology if you want to, Whatever you want, think whatever it is. I'm just telling you that the rivers of living water, the love of God cannot flow through your heart to other hearts when you live behind walls. Can't happen. You got to open your heart. You got to let yourself feel again and let yourself desire. You got to let yourself desire. God uses desire. Now, I have gone partially blind, but I think that's 1128 past there. I don't... Listen, one other thing before we go. Uh, years ago in the construction business, I learned and probably drive Rick crazy when I say this, but that when I would be on the field and I would be building, so I'm building a deck and I would get it wrong. Yeah, don't, don't start rustling on me yet. Don't start rustling on me yet and I would get it wrong, then what I would do is I would figure out a way to make it look like I intended that to begin with. <laughs> All right? That's when I was trying to live behind a mask. All those verses on the second page that made everybody work so hard to attach them weren't supposed to be there. But if you read them, every one of them, shows you the desire, the principle of desire behind the choices that people make. Every one of those verses. 
Let me give you one more and we'll, we'll pray. Do you know what Eve said when she looked at the fruit? What, what the writer said about her? See, she's, what'd she say first about the fruit? He said, can you eat from any tree in the garden? She said, any tree but the one. And that one, what happens if we even touch it? We die. Now, he confuses her and tricks her. And now she looks at it and it says, she saw that it was good for food and pleasing to the eye. What did she say about it a minute ago? I, you touch it, it'll kill you. Now it looks good for food. And it's, it's pleasing to look at. But listen, and then she said, and it was desirable to make her wise, which is what she really wanted out of this. She wanted to be equal with God. And that's what he promised her. Eat the fruit and you'll be just as smart as God. So she wanted to be just as smart as God. And I want to tell you, ladies, that you're not as smart as God, but I've yet to meet a woman that didn't think she was smarter than her husband. So I'm just teasing. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful, Lord, for this insight and understanding about how our souls work. And help us to realize that our souls operate, the fuel, the, the dynamics is in our desires. And, and what we have the power to attach our desire to you or to something that's not you. And that, that the core issue in our life is to look for what is it that I'm wanting? Why am I pursuing and chasing these things? Why do I want that? What do I think that will give me? And help us, Father, to see where we're going wrong and we're being idolatrous and help us to come back and attach our heart to you. I want you, Lord. I want to know you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to be aware of you during my moment, my moment, daily life. I want you to be part of that and me to be open and free with you and not afraid and not guilty, but forgiven. That's, the, that's my desire for all of us in these teachings, Father. We thank you again in Christ's name. Amen.